Good evening, my name is Adolfo Obius, and tonight I am going to be presenting on my trilogy, uh, The Boy Generals, George Custer, Wesley Merritt, and the Cavalry of the Army of the Potomac to the Milwaukee Civil War Roundtable. And the focus of my talk will be on the bitter enmity that developed between uh, George Custer and his immediate superior, Wesley Merritt. And, and you have a book there, if you want to describe the, the book, uh, uh, please. Go ahead, describe it. Describe it. You, know, you said what the selling price was, and then tonight, oh, okay. uh, sign copy, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, I will be signing these books tonight for the uh, Civil War Roundtable. The book normally goes for thirty-four ninety-five at your retail outlets, yeah, but as a special price for the members of this second largest Civil War Roundtable in the country, I'm going to be offering it for $25. Thank you very much. On up to the third day of Gettysburg, and Volume 2 picks up with a pursuit of Lee's beaten army down to the Potomac, uh, carries on through the Bristol campaign, and then when Grant joins the Army of the Potomac, uh, it carries on in the Overland campaign. And the last three chapters are uh, when Sheridan gets appointed to command uh, the Army of the Shenandoah, and it covers the first month of the Shenandoah Valley campaign of 1864. Volume 3 then carries on with the rest of the Valley Campaign, 64 to 65, and wraps up with the Appomattox Campaign with the emphasis on Dinwiddie Courthouse and Five Forks and, of course, Appomattox Station. So the question we're going to be looking at tonight is a spirited rivalry, which is what it was quaintly called back in those days, or a bitter enmity. This is the uh, formula, this is how it's developing as far as the cover for the books. Maybe later on at the end I can get a poll from you guys and tell me which cover you think is the best. The one on the uh, right hand side is looking like the winner right at the moment. It's a picture of uh, Wesley Merritt and George Custer sitting on opposite ends of the table, which I think is very symbolic of the uh, subject matter that we're covering and basically there couldn't have been two people that were more opposite in temperament in character and most specifically in their tactical philosophies I like to call this the battle for the soul of the cavalry and it's basically the hussar versus the dragoon now, just before the start of the Civil War, the Union, ca the cavalry of the United States Army was kind of based on the European model. It consisted of the Hussars, which were the light cavalry, the Dragoons, who were trained to fight on foot, and the heavy cavalry, which had the breastplates and never really caught out in here in the United States. But the U.S. War Department decided to combine all of these different storied cavalry units like the second u.s dragoons the mounted rifles all of these regiments that had fought on the uh, western frontier for decades were all pushed together into what became known as just the u.s cavalry they were equipped with the saber revolver and a carbine but that by no means indicates that the fight between the Hussar and the Dragoon ended. Just because the Army mandated it didn't mean that it really happened. Wesley Merritt on the top right hand side was a Dragoon. Uh, you could see from his rather, you know, it's kind of like a modest frock coat wearing the two stars of the Brigadier General. And you can see on the uh, left side what a dragoon during the Napoleonic Wars would look like. It's a pretty utilitarian uh, uniform, uh, carbine, and a saber, but basically just a coat, pants, boots, and that's pretty much it. George Custer was a hussar, probably the last hussar that 
the U.S. Army ever saw it when he died on the Little Bighorn in 1876. And here he is wearing the famous uh, black velveteen battle jacket with a sailor's coat and a red necktie, all the gold lace up the sleeves. And you can see the comparison there. On the left is a hussar with the police thrown over his shoulder, the gold lace, the vibrant colors, the big shako, and, and the colorful flag in the background. So like I say, this was a battle for the soul of the cavalry, hussar versus dragoon. Okay, so I don't know how many of you that are, have heard that old Confucius saying that sometimes you need to study the past in order to define the future. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to start with the future and work our way back towards the past. And what we're going to do with that is we're going to go to the year 1879. Now in 1879 two events took place. The first one in January was the famous Reno Court of Inquiry which the army conducted to, check, uh, to uh, review the charges of cowardice against Major Reno in his fight during the Little Bighorn. And the second one was that in August of 1879, a commission was put together to raise a statue in commemoration of George Custer on the grounds of West Point. Unfortunately for the commission, they weren't able to raise a whole lot of money and they weren't able to make an equestrian statue. So they ended up with uh, Custer on foot. Uh, the pedestal on the bottom is still the pedestal that remains at West Point today uh, at, at his gravesite. In later years, they would add a pedestal to it, and that's what remains at the point today. But back in those days, there was a statue on top of it. It shows Custer with a pistol in his left hand and a saber in the right hand and it overlooked the Hudson River. The bottom picture there shows its position uh, over the nice tranquil waters of the, of the Hudson River. Livy hated it. There are several reasons why she hated it. Number one, no one bothered to consult with her in the creation of the statue. And she would tell her friends that the depiction of Custer he was dressed like a desperado. And she dedicated her life to, make, to getting rid of that statue. In 1888, ironically, in 1882, one of the members that, had, that was on the board of the Reno Court of Inquiry, Wesley Merritt, who is said to have written a report that exonerated Reno of the charges of cowardice, became the superintendent at West Point. And that was 1882. So in essence, Libby's been trying to get rid of this statue for quite some time, and all of a sudden, the man that she feels downgraded her husband's reputation is placed in charge of West Point, and the whole sordid matter of getting rid of the statue falls into uh, Wesley Merritt's lap. So at this point, Libby decides her only recourse is to go to uh, then General of the Army, William Tecumseh Sherman. And she writes to Sherman and she says, basically, years ago, I knew General Merritt was his enemy. When we entertained him on the plains, he seemed to have conquered his enmity and jealousy that was so bitter in the Army of the Potomac. But when he was placed as head of the Court of Inquiry, I saw all through the trial how uh, General Merritt still felt towards his dead comrade. So this is where I got this letter, is where I got the idea that, hey, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books written about George Custer, only one book about Wesley Merritt. So this letter for me was kind of like, okay, this is great. I found a niche that I could write about George Custer that no one's ever written about. So. This is what got me go going on, on the, the trilogy that I wrote. And like I say, it says the enmity and jealousy that was so bitter. There's, there's no denying that that's what Libby meant. And they did entertain him on the plane. 
And I wrote about it in the first book, and it's a hilarious story. Because everybody knows that George Custer was a prankster of the first class. And when they were out there in the plains, they held together a buffalo hunt in Wesley Merritt's honor because Merritt served on the Schofield board that was reviewing cavalry tactics and armaments. So they took him out there, and in the middle of it, Custer played a huge prank on Merritt that just ha had him absolutely fuming. But uh, that's, in chapter, that's in volume one. Oh, can't say volume one. I'm supposed to say Stallman. Okay, so that brings us back to West Point. Wesley Merritt graduated from the class of 1860. It was the only class in West Point history to have five terms. And the reason for it was that at that time, West Point was under the auspices of the engineering department. And then Secretary of War Jefferson Davis, who later became president of the Confederate States, decided that there was just too much math, too much engineering, and not enough soldiering going on. So he added a fifth term to, to the uh, four that were already in place. And Merritt was one of the guys that went through the five-year course. He graduated in 1860 and was commissioned a lieutenant in the second U.S. Dragoon stationed on the Utah frontier, which is quite a ways away. George Custer graduated from the class of a... Oh, and I, by the way, I could never find a picture of Wesley Merritt as a, as a cadet. That's the closest I could find to him being young. He's a captain in this one. George Custer, on the other hand, we do have a, a cadet picture of him, and there's several of them, actually. He graduated in 1861, and the fact that he graduated at all is a testament to his discipline and his get up and go. He very, at West Point, you had 100 demerits just per term. If you went over 100 demerits, you were out of the academy. That was all she wrote for you. One particular year, George Custer reached 99 demerits. He was one merit away from being thrown out. And it just goes to show you the incredible discipline that he had that he was able to go the rest of the term without getting that one demerit and being thrown out. But then he really screwed things up in the last week of uh, his final term at, at West Point. He was standing a tour of duty as officer of the guard when two of the new cadets got into a fight. His, uh, his duty as officer of the guard was clearly to maintain the peace and tranquility of the academy. And instead, he got between the two guys, pushed them aside, said, let there be a fair fight, boys. The officer of the day heard the commotion, came out, saw the gross neglect of duty that Custer had just committed, arrested him, and he was court-martialed. He hadn't been sentenced when the war broke out, and friends of his that had graduated from his class had gone down to Washington, and they used their influence to make sure that he was never sentenced. And of course, with the war came the need for trained officers, so George Custer joined the Union Army just before the Battle of Bull Run. Of these two guys, Custer saw action first. He was present at the Battle of Bull Run. And I like to say that Custer used to see the battlefield with the eyes of a child. And what I mean by that is that he went straight from West Point to the battlefield. He never served in a regular uh, cavalry unit. Therefore, he didn't have the, the traditions, the restrictions, all the panoply, the, all the stuff that goes with being a regular soldier in the regular army. So he viewed the battlefield with the eyes of a child. And even at that point, he was already, uh, he already had a notion of what the cavalry man was. And that was a mounted man going full speed at his enemy with his sword pointed at him with the only intent on his mind of cleaving the poor guy's skull in half. And that was what George Custer was all about. Wesley Merritt, stationed out on the frontier, the war breaks out, 
It takes them two months to get from Utah to the eastern pier of, of operations. The commander of the Second Dragoons is a guy by the name of Philip St. George Cook, who was a bit of a paradox in that he was commanding a unit that was trained to fight on foot, but was a proponent of the mounted charge, and was in fact writing a cavalry manual at the time of uh, the Peninsula Campaign. And his good buddy McClellan told him to take that manual and stick it where it doesn't shine, because you couldn't institute a new manual in the middle of a campaign. Merritt was assigned to B Company, which was commanded by, at that time, Captain John Buford. And of course, anybody who studied uh, the Battle of Gettysburg knows that it was Buford's dismounted stand on the first day of the battle that kind of set the pace for what that battle was to become by allowing uh, the infantry corps to come in and occupy Cemetery Hill and Cemetery Ridge. So in those two months, John Buford taught Wesley Merritt the rudiments of cavalry operations, how to walk a horse line, what to look for, how to use troops dismounted. And it got to the point where Merritt became a, a dragoon. And he had his men strap their sabers to the saddles. And we'll go into that in a little bit more detail in, in a couple of slides. So these are the mentors that they had. Custer's mentors were George B. McClellan, who he served on his staff during the Peninsula War, and Alfred Pleasanton, who commanded the Cavalry Corps after Stoneman and Philip St. George Cook left. Merritt's mentors were Philip St. George Cook and John Buford. Uh, Philip St. George, well, let's go back to the peninsula for a minute. Custer was a hell rage. There's no other way to put it. He had developed a, a bad reputation for being a, a heavy drinker, and his association with generals like Philip Kearney only increased his ability to swear like a real trooper. And in this picture, you can see him sitting around with his uh, staff buddies. This picture was taken about 1862. And no, that is not Wesley Merritt in the corner over there. And you can see the bottles of whiskey and the wine bottles. And he was, like I say, he was just a drinker. You know, when you watch that movie, uh, they die with their boots on. There's that one scene where he gets drunk and he trundles down the road and passes by in front in a totally drunken stupor in front of Judge Bacon's house. And he's, he and Libby decide that they're not going to speak to each other for fear of embarrassment. And they, then he ends up going through some of Libby's friends as an intermediary to make sure that all of his letters get to Libby. But George Custer, 1862, the Peninsula Campaign, a drinker, a cursor, a general hellraiser. His one moment of glory came when he was out reconnoitering. He was, at this time, he was attached to the topographical engineers. And uh, the commander of the uh, topographical engineers was Cat, uh, General Barnard. And he tells Custer to jump into the Chickahominy River and conduct a small reconnaissance of the enemy positions on the other side. So Custer pulls out his pistol, jumps into the Chickahominy, and spends about 15, 20 minutes on the other side while Bernard's sitting on his horse, fuming mad at his subordinates' time on the other side. But as Custer said, while the Chickahominy might have been the source of a lot of misfortunes for the Army of the Potomac, and it was almost literally a stepping stone for my personal advancement. Bernard, as a result of Custer's actions on that reconnaissance, takes him and introduces him to George McClellan, and McClellan asks him to join his staff. And that was the beginning of Custer's meteoric rise to generalship by 1863.
course, when McClellan loses his job after the disaster of the peninsula, Custer's left without a job. In the meantime, things didn't go too well for Wesley Merritt either. Like I say, Philip St. George Cook was a little bit of a paradox. A dragoon trained to fight on command, trained to fight on foot, he is a big proponent of the mounted charge. And at the Battle of Gaines Mill, when the Confederates strike the Union line and just about rout it completely, there's only one bridge across the Chickahominy, and it looks like it's going to be a real disaster for the Union Army. At that moment, St. George Cook orders a mounted cavalry charge, and it's a failure. It was only a small detachment, and there was no way they were going to do anything to stop the Confederates from crushing the Union Army. But Fitz John Porter, who commanded the Fifth Corps at this time, places the blame on Cook's charge and is supported in that uh, accusation by George McClellan. So again, we go back to the mentors that they had. St. George Cook for uh, Merritt, McClellan for Custer. Well, St. George Cook resigns as Cavalry Corps commander at this stage of the game, and that leaves Merritt without a job. So right at the moment, Custer and Merritt are both without jobs. And that's a picture at the bottom there of uh, the 5th U.S. Cavalry, which was the unit that uh, St. George Cook sent against the Confederates. So right now, both of them are without jobs. All that changed when Alfred Pleasanton was appointed Cavalry Corps commander. And that's when the first cracks in the relationship between Custer and Merritt start to occur. First of all, they haven't met at this stage of the game. It's still shortly after the Peninsula Campaign, McClellan's in disgrace, uh, Alfred Pleasanton is, is appointed when Stoneman is relieved and Philip St. George Cook quits and he asks Custer and Merritt to go on his staff. Well, Merritt only lasted two weeks. And there were several things that, when I say that the first cracks appear, there are several things that occurred during this time period that made those cracks appear. Number one, we don't know for a fact, it, let's call it a sense of humor. We don't know if Merritt even had a sense of humor. He was very contemplative, very serious, and he thought that Custer was too gregarious, too obnoxious, and the word insufferable we use quite often. Another one of the things that Merritt disliked intensely about Custer was that Yes, Custer did graduate last in his class at West Point, but as he points out in his unfinished, unpublished memoirs, that only occurred because of the fact that the Southern cadets had all quit and that there would have been several Southern boys who would have fought, for him, fought him for the honor of being the tail end Charlie of the class. But, uh, you know, an example of Custer's friendship with his Southern boys was he served as best man to, uh, at the wedding of his good friend from West Point, Gimlet Lee. Lee got married on the southern side of the Potomac River, and he invited Custer to cross the Potomac and serve as his uh, best man. So here he is in a room surrounded with officers in Confederate gray, and Custer's the lone man in Union blue, and needless to say, the southern girls are just swooning all over him. Third thing was their choice of mentors, which is comes back to haunt the situation at this point. As we said, Fitz John Porter, in command of the Fifth Corps, puts the blame on Saint on Philip St. George Cook for the disaster at Gaines Mill, and Merritt spends the rest of his life defending Philip St. George Cook. So and he obviously blamed McClellan for the disaster that the ruination of Philip St. George Cook's career 
and Custer B. McClellan's boy, there was that transfer of that situation there. So after two weeks on the staff, Merritt asked for a transfer to a combat unit and he's given command of the uh, 2nd U.S. Cavalry. He's at the Battle of Brandy Station commanding the 2nd U.S. Cavalry. Now, when I set out to write this book, I had two challenges that I needed to overcome. The first challenge was the mythology that had surrounded Custer and still surrounds Custer to this day and it needs to be debunked if we're ever to find out what kind of soldier Custer really was. Mm -hmm. And the second thing we need to find out is the enigma that is Wesley Merritt, because there's only one book, that, one biography, one full-scale biography that's ever been written about him. Now one of the things, one of the mythologies that we talk about as an example, as they're advancing down the road from Beverly Ford towards the Confederate positions at uh, the old St. James Church, Colonel Benjamin Grimes Davis is leading the Union advance. A Confederate pops out from behind a tree and shoots him in the head and Davis is dead. In 1967, no, 1957, Jay Monahan writes a book called Custer, The Life of George Armstrong Custer in which he says that at this point the command of the of uh, brigade fell on Custer. In 1967, B.A. Kingsley, who, who was probably more of a screenwriter than he was a historian, makes the case that uh, Custer did take command and the reason for it was that he was being tested for greater things at that moment. And finally in 1997, the great historian Jeffrey Ward put an end to all those things and said this is an inaccurate story and it never happened. The attack on the old St. James Church is pictured on the top and the attack is a failure. But by this time Custer is back on the Brandy Station side and his bugler left an account that was found in uh, Libby Custer's papers in which he said the next movement was of Colonel Merritt's regiment. Custer and I had the lead. Well, let's take a look at that statement. Seriously. Merritt's a little bit of a martinet. You know, he's a stickler for detail and regulations. The chances of George Custer getting ahead of Wesley Merritt in a charge on the enemy are zero to none. Well, the charge on Old St. James Church is a failure and Buford moves most of his men over to the right flank. And on the right flank, well, when he makes that move, Buford's accompanied by two regiments of infantry. And the, the officers of the, those two infantry regiments left quite a bit of material about Custer at that point. And one of them, uh, well, Buford orders Merritt to take U Ridge, which is a spur of land on the end of Fleetwood Hill. If you're familiar with the uh, with the Brandy Station battlefield, Fleetwood Hill is a long stretch of ground, and then at the very end of it is a spur of U Ridge, and Buford sends Merritt to take U Ridge, and one of the cavalry, uh, one of the infantry officers, tells a story that Custer was there with his golden hair flying in the breeze his horse prancing and he was dancing with excitement and it was obvious that Custer wanted to go. Well, sometimes when you're writing history you have to connect some dots and the dot is did Custer and Merritt exchange words after this so-called Custer led Merritt's men? Did Merritt approach Custer? Did they have harsh words? Did Merritt tell Custer to mind his own business? It's a distinct possibility that that happened because when Merritt, and here he is in the bottom picture in a painting by Don Stivers, Custer is nowhere to be seen. Custer does not go with Merritt. He still considers to be his old buddy from 
West Point. He just doesn't know that Merritt's turned against him or is in the process of turning against him. So Merritt gets into a fight with what many people say was Rooney Lee, and he almost gets his head knocked off, you know, gets a sword swipe, almost beheads him. But uh, this is another indication that things are not going too well between Merritt and Custer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick out a couple of spots rather than just stick with the first book which is already published. I'm going to pick out a couple of spots in the trilogy that kind of develop the theme of a dysfunctional relationship that's going from bad to worse. The first one I call the fork in the road and this is the uh, prelude to Gettysburg. It's the Aldi Middleburg Upperville campaign and as you can see at the bottom at Aldi, all the Union cavalry passes through the Aldi Gap on that, on that day. Merritt takes the road going to the northwest towards Snickers Gap. Custer takes the road going completely west towards Ashby's Gap. Now, the ground that Custer finds himself in is very suitable for the operations of mounted cavalry, whereas <coughs> the ground that Merritt finds himself in has, is heavy with agriculture, a lot of stone walls, a lot of stout wooden fences, so he turns to dismounted fighting. And down below is a famous uh, painting, a uh, sketch that appeared in Harper's Ferry Magazine. It shows Colonel Dowdy of the First Maine on Custer's left going down. He's been shot in the chest and killed. And on the right side is Judson Kilpatrick. His horse has been killed and throws him to the ground. And the only man that's in front leading the first main is George Custer, who finds himself in the middle of the rebels with the dust and the battle smoke swirling all around him. And he credits the fact that he was wearing a Confederate-style slouch hat to the fact that he was able to make his way out of what was obviously a very serious situation for him. But uh, that, that appeared in Harper's Ferry, uh, Harper's Weekly, rather, and... Uh, it was quite a famous sketch from the time. And up above you see a line of dismounted skirmishers. This is what Merritt would have employed on the northern, northwestern part of the battlefield with all its stone walls. Just before the start of the Gettysburg Campaign, Special Orders 98 are issued by uh, Pleasanton and he appoints Wesley Merritt George Custer and Lon Farnsworth from the rank of captain to the rank of brigadier general, skipping four grades in between and seriously upsetting most of the cavalry corps and infantry of the, of the U.S. Army. Uh, what I like about this picture is the fact that, like I say, it's kind of like a juxtaposition of these two guys facing each other with totally different personalities, totally different philo tactical philosophies, and this was the day it, it started, June 28, 1863, one day, two days before the Battle of Gettysburg. So what's Custer's luck? Let's see if I can get this one to work. I've always had troubles with this. Was Custer's luck to be assigned to General George McClellan's staff? The answer to, be, to that would be no. Was Custer's luck to be posted to Major General Alfred Pleasanton's Cavalry Corps staff? Again, the answer to that is no. Was Custer's luck to participate in over 80 charges during the war and only be one, wounded one time? No. What is the real Custer's luck? Well, the real Custer's luck is that when he was appointed Brigadier General, he was given command of the Michigan Brigade, the Cavalry Brigade. And one full regiment and part of another were armed with a Spencer repeating carbine or at that time it was a rifle. The carbine hadn't yet gone into production but it was the first repeating arm that uh, existed and Custer took full advantage of the fact that uh, his arm, men were armed with it and developed a tactical, a cohesive tactical philosophy based on the use of the repeating rifle. Now I'm not going to stand here and tell you that 
George Custer was a tactical genius, because he was. He was just using the tools that he was given and making, taking the most advantage of them. Wilder was doing the same thing in the Western Army. His men were also equipped with the Spencer, and he was doing tremendous things with it. But were they tactical geniuses? No. What's war? War is using the tools that you're given to their fullest advantage. And in this case, they happen to be the recipients of probably the finest repeating rifle that was available at the time. So now we switch to the Yellow Tavern campaign, or at least the beginning of the Yellow Tavern campaign. This is when Phil Sheridan has already taken over, and he leads a raid to Richmond. And while they're on the raid to Richmond, the Confederates are scrambling on his rear and on his flanks. They're trying to get ahead of him because they know where he's headed. He's heading for Richmond. So they're trying to get ahead of him. And he goes to the rear of the column, which was said to be 15 miles long. That's how many cavalrymen Sheridan had at that time. He had close to 10,000 men. The line stretched for 15 miles and took hours and hours and hours in passing. That left Custer at the front of the line. Well, Custer was never the kind of guy to just sit still. So he finds out that there's three locomotives and two trains full of supplies and medical supplies at Beaver Dam Station. So Custer decides he's going to attack Beaver Dam Station. And he gets to Beaver Dam Station and he destroys the trains, he destroys the locomotives, he frees over 400 prisoners and he destroys 8 to 10 miles of telegraph wire and railroad. And in the bottom pictures you can see the method of destruction that was used in those days for uh, destroying the railroads. They would take the creosote soap railroad ties, they would lay the metal rails on top of it, and when they were hot enough and pliable enough, they would take them and they would twist them around a tree or a post, and those would never be used as railroad ties again. Well, Merritt was upset, extremely upset, because at that time, on this raid, the cavalry was supposed to be living off the land. They had made the conscious decision that they were only going to supply their horses with enough feed for one and a half days, and the men were only going to be taking three days' worth of rations. The rest of the room in the saddlebags was going to be taken up with ammunition. Pockets were stuffed with ammunition. It was ammunition, ammunition, ammunition. And uh, Merritt writes to the effect and calls it a gaucherie, that Custer had committed a gaucherie, which is a pretty nasty word, meaning, well, I'm not quite sure, I'm not that great of a French scholar, to be honest with you, but it's not good. Uh, then we move on to the Battle of Trevelyan Station, and this is the time when things really start getting going from bad to worse for Merritt and Custer. On the first day of the Battle of Trevelyan Station, Custer is ordered to take this little logging trail in which the men could only march in columns of two to go all the way down to Trevelyan Station and he was going to burn the station. Merritt was to advance up to Fredericksburg Road and also attack Trevelyan Station. Well, I took this picture on the bottom left-hand side of uh, the Fredericksburg Road which is nowhere what it was like back in those days. Back in those days, it was heavily tree-lined with thick underbrush, and Merritt's attack loses steam. And he spends three hours in getting up that road to where Custer is at Trevelyan Station. Now, Custer, he's in the wrong position, too. He was told that if he took that road, he'd be coming out 70 yards from the Trevelyan Station. Instead, because of the fact that they didn't have any good maps of the South, it, his men ended up 700 yards from the railroad station. But while he's in the back, he now finds himself behind Wade Hampton's Confederate Army, uh, Confederate Cavalry, which is confronting Merritt as Merritt tries to move up the Fredericksburg Road. And in that back, there's all the wagon trains, the lead horses, caissons, Custer orders the 5th Michigan to attack the 
5th Michigan advances well past Trevelyan Station, even though his orders were very specific. Go to the station. That's where we're all going to meet. Fitzhugh Lee is down here in the corner at Louisa Courthouse. He's had a terrible day so far. He was supposed to have attacked Custer way up north, but he didn't put in a very, very much of a, a good effort. It was a half-hearted effort, and he retreats back to Louisa Courthouse. But then, Custer gets on the Gordonsville Road. Fitzhugh Lee ends up, as you can see down there, he ends up in Custer's rear and Custer's left flank. Thomas Rosser, who was one of Custer's best friends from West Point, comes down the road from the west on the Gordonsville Road and attacks the 5th Michigan Cavalry and just about decimates it. And then Wade Hampton finally turns from confronting Merritt and rides right through Custer's troops. In the process of riding through Custer's troops, and there's a picture of the melee at the bottom, there's a little wagon right in the center of the thing. Well, that's Custer's headquarters wagon. And in it are his uniforms, all the official documents of a regiment and a brigade, uh, but most important of all are Custer's love letters from Liddy. And the Confederate newspapers had a field day printing Liddy's love letters to Custer in the newspapers. And Custer says they were a bit racy. And if you read them, they were more than just a bit racy. What the Confederates would do is they would pass the package of letters from house to house where they were having parties and they would read the letters out loud to each other and get a good chuckle over some of the things that Liddy would say to Custer. And Custer was forced to tell his beloved wife that, hey, someone needs to be a little bit more careful in the use of the double entendu. <laughs> Second day at Trevelyan Station. By this, this time, the action has swung slightly northwest. They've already burnt uh, Trevelyan Station, and they're moving on the Gordonsville Road, heading towards Charlottesville. Again, we go back to that theory that sometimes a historian needs to kind of connect the dots, even though there's no specific information that you can come up with to the effect. But what ended up happening was that during that melee on the previous page, Custer was hit by several spent bullets. And one of those spent bullets hit him right on the knocker, right on the head. So the next day, Custer's supposed to attack the Confederates on the left flank while Merritt attacks him on the front. Merritt complains that Custer wasn't there for him and that as a result of that, his brigade, his brigade suffered heavy losses. Well, I don't know if you guys are aware, George Custer was a prolific writer. This guy could write details, detailed, detailed reports of actions that are just incredible. And on the first day of Trillian Station, he wrote a report that was about two and a half pages long. Now, when, on the second day, he only writes a half a paragraph. So now we're having to go back and try and connect the dot. Well, what's the dot? The dot is Custer got hit in the head by a spent bullet. And he writes to Libby that the bruising is going away, that he's all right and everything. But basically that could just be construed as, oh, this is a husband just trying to, you know, let his wife, keep his wife from being too worried about it. But what I think happened was that on that day, on the second day of Trevelyan Station, Custer suffered a concussion on the first day. And he wasn't present on the second day. And therefore, he only wrote a half-page report on the action. And the reports of all his regimental officers disappeared into the black hole that was the War Department. So all we have left of the second day of Trevelyan is that little bitty thing from Custer. And then we have Merritt's official report in which he places 
Merritt conducted over seven attacks against Butler, South Carolinians, or Carolinians, I should say, and failed in every one of them. And he places the blame on the fact that he was not supported on the left flank by Custer and his men. And Custer tells Libby, I carried my instructions out to the letter. Now, both of these guys are in the official records. It doesn't get more official than that, than to have your, your uh, accusations, recriminations in the official record. And now both of these guys are pointing the finger at each other and saying, no, you're the blame, you're the blame, you're the blame. So from the second day of Trevelyan Station, that's when things get start turning really serious between Custer and Merritt. At the end of the Overland Campaign, Phil Sheridan is appointed to command the Army of the Shenandoah. And operating in the rear of the Army of the Potomac and the Army of the Shenandoah is John Singleton Mosby and four companies of his partisan rangers. And you can see the picture on the left. It shows him attacking a, a wagon train full of supplies. And then there's the famous Berryville raid, which took place on August 13th, when Sheridan finally ordered his wagons to advance to bring up needed supplies. Mosby had already reconnoitered the situation and attacked the 300 men. The guys that were guarding the train were 100 day men from Ohio. After the first howitzer took the head off a mule, they just scattered and ran. Mosby burnt over 100 wagons. The command went without food for the men, feed for the horses. Well, Custer in his trademark black velveteen uniform had been seen in the streets of Front Royal, which was just a little ways away from Berryville where the train would was ambushed. So everybody knew Custer was in the area. After the Battle of Winchester, which took place on September 19th, Sheridan orders Alfred Corbett, who was commanding the Cavalry Corps at that time, to head up the Luray Valley. Now when you look at the Shenandoah Valley, you got the Blue Ridge Mountains on this side, the Allegheny Mountains on this side, and right down in the middle, you got a range of mountains called the Massanutten Mountains. And Torbert is ordered to go to the, between the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Massanutten Mountains, find a gap, cut through the gap, and cut off Early's retreat after the Battle of Winchester. But the Confederates mount a stubborn rear guard, and in the process, Torbert decides, hey, this isn't worth it, I'm just going to head back. So. He puts, as he heads back, he puts the train of wounded from that rather sharp skirmish in the gap on the road first. And they're attacked by Mosby's men. And in the process, Charles Lowell's brigade, was, which was following hard on the heels of the wounded train, captures seven of Mosby's men. Four of them were shot down right in the streets of Front Royal. One of them was a kid, he was 17 years old, he was on his first raid with Mosby. And they put him right in front of his mother and some guy emptied all, all the shots in his revolver into the guy right in front of his mother. Finally they restored some semblance of orders. And the orders were from Grant, and those orders were very specific. If you catch any of Mosby's men, you, well, heck, they'd already shot five of them to death in tawdry situations. But he did end up hanging two of the men. And they were left hanging on that oak tree that you could barely see. On the, there's Front Royal in the background. There's that oak tree there. That's the famous oak tree from which the two men hung for several days. But Custer is accused by Mosby of having murdered his men in an article that appeared in the Richmond Times on September 3rd, 1899. Well, after the war, Custer denied it. He said he never had anything to do with the murder of Mosby's men. In 1874, when they were staking out the track beds for the Northern Pacific Railroad, Tom Rosser, who we remember from Trevelyan Station, 
and who was Custer's good friend, was one of the engineers that was laying out the track bed. And they would get together underneath the tent fly and swap war stories at the end of the day. And Rosser said that Custer always denied that he had anything to do with the murder of Mosby's men. But the damage was done, and Custer has always been blamed for the execution of Mosby's captured men. The Battle of Cedar Creek. This is when things really break out into the open. Surprise attack by Jubal Early scatters the Union three Union Army Corps. The only people that are holding their ground is the Union Cavalry. Merritt's forces are on the right flank. Custer's forces are on the left flank. Custer mounts a charge, cuts in behind the Confederates, and by the way, that picture in the middle, that's as bogus as it can get. Custer and Sheridan were never side by side in the middle of the Cedar Creek charge. But 48 guns are captured and 15 battle flags are captured. And Custer sends out a congratulatory order to, he's already a, a division commander by this point, and he sends out a congratulatory order to his men. Well, Wesley Merritt gets really upset that Custer is hogging all the glory. He's, he wants part of the glory. So Custer, in what was obviously a political stunt in a political election year, presents the captured flags at the War Department, and Merritt doesn't get anything. So he has a meeting, he writes to the assistant adjutant and basically calls Custer a liar for claiming to have captured 45 of the 48 guns and 15 of the flags. So they have a meeting and you can just picture the tent, Merritt, Custer, Sheridan inside, officers hanging all around listening to the generals going at it and Merritt begs Custer to give him a little credit, give me a little love, give me a few guns, give me a few flags. Custer says, if I don't get full credit for what I did, then I don't want any of it. Roger Hannaford, a trooper with the 2nd Ohio Cavalry, says, it came at last to hard words. Custer going so far as to say he would fight for his rights, and there was a great danger of it ending in a duel. Well. Hannaford's wasn't the only account. There was no danger of there being a duel. Duels were illegal, especially between two high-ranking officers like uh, Custer and Merritt. There was no way that that was going to happen. What did happen was that Custer threatened to take Merritt out back of the tent and beat the heck out of him. And that's been noted by several people. So Custer was pretty upset that Merritt would go ahead. Somehow this letter that Merritt wrote to the assistant adjutant general, ends up in the newspapers. So in public, Merritt's calling Custer a liar, and from that point on, it's all downhill. Sheridan, in the meantime, decides the matter for them all. He says, no, I saw Custer taking him. And that's how it ended. Custer ended up with the credit for 45 guns and all of the flags, and Merritt was left with nothing. And now things are really getting rocked. So this is the last one as far as, by now Custer has developed a plan of insubordination. He is going to be insubordinate to merit every opportunity that he gets. After the winter of 64 is over and the spring campaign begins, they're headed out of the Shenandoah Valley, heading south, heading towards Petersburg. Merritt issues an order saying that the, command, the cavalry command must husband the strength of their horses. That's all he's concerned about, is making sure that the horses aren't too tired, too underfed. Great care has to be taken of the horses. Well, Custer's response is just to put the spurs to the horses, and he heads towards Waynesboro as fast as he can. And that's where he finds the remnants of Jubal Early's army and outflanks him on the right, 
drives him across the Shenandoah Valley, and the campaign in the Shenandoah is over and done with. And Custer gets the credit, and it was because of his insubordinate actions in pushing the horses way beyond what his instructions had allowed for him to do. Too petty for words is about the only way you can describe the actions of these two guys during the Appomattox campaign, which kind of closes his presentation. At Dinwiddie Courthouse, Custer comes to the relief of Merritt, who had, ter had a terrible day that day. And Custer's lining up his men to make a charge uh, on what he perceives to be a beautiful field of green grass. Merritt knows better. He's already been over that ground, and he knows that underneath that grass, there's nothing but quicksand, mud, and just terrible conditions. And we don't know if he told Custer to stay on the roads, and Custer just didn't listen to him, or if he just kept the information to himself. But when Custer's men sounded, bugler sounded the charge, they rush into that field, and the thing is a shambles. Horses are falling all over the place. Men are dropping out of their saddles. And the charge doesn't go anywhere. The Battle of Namazine Church. Two days, just a few days later, Thomas Devon's brigade has been in action, all, division has been in action all day and all night, and Merritt has ordered them to go into camp. He rides up to Custer and asks and orders Custer to take over from Devon. Custer turns around, looks at Merritt and says, finish your own work. That's in subordination of the worst kind. And then finally we get to Appomattox Station, the end of a long, hard campaign. According to Army protocol, it was Custer's turn to lead the road, on the road that day. A staff officer from Merritt comes up to Custer and tells Custer to push his division to the side of the road and that he would sit by the side of the road until the other two divisions of the Cavalry Corps passed him and then he would fall in at the very end of it. Well, Custer knows that there's three trains sitting at Appomattox Station and what he does is he tells his men to gallop to Appomattox Station knowing full well that by the time his actions get back to Merritt, and Merritt responds by sending him further orders to Custer. Custer's already destroyed Appomattox Station, because that's the kind of guy he was. So that's pretty much where things end. Ironically, at Appomattox Station, Custer is the recipient of the white flag, one of the white flags. He rushes down into the Confederate lines and confronts uh, General James Longstreet, and Longstreet just upbraids Custer. One of uh, Longstreet's officers said Longstreet rebuffed him, however, very roughly, far more so than appears in Longstreet's account of the interview. So Longstreet wailed into Custer, and Custer left with his tail between his legs back to his lines. And that's pretty much where the story ends. I'll be glad to take any questions. Any questions? I get, I've got one. I mean, uh, reading about Civil War generals and West Point graduates, <coughs> I always call it, I've gotten to call it lately, like the West Point fever. That you need that you need 100,000 men and 200 cans and uh, supplies and trains and boats and ships before you start a campaign. Pleasure. I mean, was Custer more like Stonewall Jackson or, or something like that? I think that Custer was used to acting independently and he was a little bit of a, well he was flamboyant, he was uh, independent, he was gregarious, he was used to, like I say, acting alone and he didn't really want to be hearing from Merritt. And Merritt even after he was promoted to Cavalry Corps Commander, had a bad habit of attaching himself to Thomas Devon. Uh, Devon by that time was a division commander, but Devon was also 
one of the brigades that was with Buford at Gettysburg, and he was one of the brigades that stopped the Confederates at Gettysburg on the first day of the battle. And they were good friends, and Merritt had the habit of attaching himself to uh, Devin's men. I have only one instance in all my research where I found that uh, Merritt actually intervened in the inner workings of Custer's division, and that was at the Battle of Five Forks. But with all the research I did, that's, that's the only case I've ever been able to find where Merritt actually gave orders to one of Custer's officers without going through Custer. Other questions? Over here. Okay. Yes. Did your research find anything on Merritt's either love life or whatever we know about Libby? She wrote quite a bit defending Custer. Anything that, no. from that perspective? No, and that's why I say that one of my projects is going to be uh, on merit because I think there is a much need for another biography of merit. It'll be strictly the Civil War. I've been to the National Archives. I've copied everything that was in the General's papers, General Merritt's papers. I have all that information at home. But these are all official reports or official notes sent by his commanders in the field. But I don't think anybody has ever found that treasure trove of love letters or things like that that Custer had, that Libby had. Any more? All right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate you guys uh, letting me, appreciate you guys letting me lead off uh, as a speaker for your new season. Well, thank you, thank you, Al. Don't go away. Okay. We are presenting you with a certificate of honor by the order of the general staff of the Civil War Roundtable in Milwaukee. This award is, present, is presented to Al Olvies for furthering our understanding of the causes and consequences of the American Civil War, the watershed event in our nation's history. Thank you very much. And you're not done yet. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, while much of my thunder in talking about the history of the Iron Brigade Association was stolen earlier, yeah. uh, it is my pleasure, on behalf of the association, to present a lapel pin signifying membership in the organization to Al Ovis. Well, thank you very much. Like I said, it's a real honor to kick off your new season and speak to you guys. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Please do. <laughs> well, that concludes our uh, meeting for this evening. Uh, I invite you to attend our, our next uh, meeting, which will be October 12th, uh, right here at the Wisconsin Club. And the speaker will be Carlton Young, uh, subject being Voices from the Attic. So, hope to see you then. This one statement, I do have a special prize for you guys. Uh, the book retails for $34.95, and I've got a special price of $25. Bucks. Oh, and that would also include the shipping and handling, so it would be $34.95 plus shipping and handling. And we're going to go ahead and let you guys have it for $25. Bucks.